This podcast is proud to be part of the TalkSport Fan Network. TalkSport. Powered by fans. The TalkSport Fan Network is proudly supported by McDelivery, bringing you the food you love. McDelivery brings a top-tier lineup of food right to your door. No matter the results, you'll always be winning with McDelivery. Order now on the McDonald's app and you'll get rewards points delivered too. So that ordering today means some tasty rewards for tomorrow. Only via app at participating restaurants. 18 plus rewards registration required. Points only on menu items, delivery fee and terms apply. See mcdonalds.com. <laughs> Ladies and gents, boys and girls, welcome to Monday Night's Tilt and Talk Show. Here we go. We might be doing the, the old hour and a half tonight as football has made its way back. Yes, football is back. There's no supporters, no fans, and it's a little bit different, but at least we've got games on. And uh, welcome, as I say, to the Tilt and Talk Show Monday night. That's myself, Paul Hipkiss. Good evening, all. Nat Peters. Good evening. Mrs. Brown. Good evening. <laughs> Is of course the penalty winner to take us into the Premier League, Darren Carter. Good evening, guys. Okay, the Tilton Talk Show is sponsored by Boyle Sports, which we're very grateful for all the sponsorship we've had this year. Thank you very much indeed. And of course, our friends at SAS Autos and Bordsley Labour Club. Uh, on with the show we go because we've got plenty to talk about tonight. And first off, we start always with the sad news. And a message came through from uh, Birmingham City Football Club that it is with great sadness that we learn today of the passing of lifelong Blues fan and stadium tour guide, Rick Coleman. Rick devoted his life to the club. Rest in peace. And I'm sure everybody sentiments that, certainly on the talk show, and everybody out there uh, listening and looking into uh, uh, Rick Coleman. Rest in peace. Very sad. And uh, nextly, I've got uh, a message here. All I've had a message in regards to little Arthur and a GoFundMe page that has been set up to help give him a good send-off and also a plaque at St Andrews. Nick, can you mention this later? And also advertise that they have uh, a signed Will Arbor shirt for auction. It says short, but I think he means shirt. Uh, <laughs> also tag the page as you mention it, and uh, let's see what we can raise tonight. Is that OK? Of course it's OK. Of course it's OK. Of course it's OK. And uh, welcome, Darren, to the show. Benjamin Jackson sent me a message as well. Hi, mate, this is a big ask, but when you have carts on the show, could you do a shout-out for my dad who's still recovering from a massive stroke as the penalty versus Norwich was one of his favourite moments as a blue nose. So if you could do that duty for me, my phone would be very, very happy. Oh, yeah. I uh, wish him all the best. And, uh, you know, I know it's a special memory for him. Obviously, it is for me. So, uh, yeah, all the best and uh, get well soon. Thank you very much indeed. Now, there's a big campaign going on at the moment. I just shared on my Facebook page to get the club crest on the GM so that it can be seen from the city centre and we can advertise our football club and uh, all the great things that go along with it. So uh, please do sign up. It's 433 signatures a little early when I checked, still required, to get it above the 1,000 so it can be discussed. Uh, and uh, you will find that on my personal Facebook page. I'll probably share it to the Tilt and Talk page after the show's finished. OK, right, on we go then. So football's back, Paul. Football's mm-hmm. back, Nat. Football's back, Chris. Football's back, Carl. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> we, had a game. we had a game. Oh, man. Oh, um, defensively, what a superb performance as well to put out. Yeah. I mean, they absolutely battled their hearts out. West Brom came to do a job, <clears throat> and uh, we, we did a job on them. Defensively, we were absolutely stunning. Brilliant. Yeah. What a Paul. Oh. Yeah, we were solid um, from start to finish. It was a really well-organised, um, strong team performance from the lads. And, uh, you know, we got thoroughly what we deserved. I, I, I did think as well, though, with VAR, we would have got a penalty as well when, 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 when Gary Gardner headed the ball onto their player's arm. Mm. Oh, yeah, VAR yeah. Been there. It was, that was well, our walk. The situation is we haven't got VAR. It was no penalty. It was a nil-nil draw. We'll take that draw at West Bromwich Albion. You'd have taken a second oh. draw. You'd have bitten the uh, random. I would have bit your hand off for a draw, but um, you know, ju- ju- just just that in fact of the situation that we would have got a penalty with VAR. In my, in my opinion, anyway. What do you think, Dad? Yeah, I, I, straight away, my initial thought was that um, when he headed it back across goal, um, it was going. I'm not sure he was in the box. It might have been Juki or Hogan. Um, it seemed to be going towards well, a blue shirt anyway. So my um, yeah. yellow shirt, should I say? But um, so yeah, my initial reaction was that's his hand. That's a penalty. Um, yeah. With. We're not blessed, are we, with the uh, the old VAR? And um, but yeah, just to echo what you said, a point I thought was a fantastic result. Super, um, yeah. I think West Brom give them a couple more games. The sharper and and 
you know, the more they get back to their own tempo, um, I think they'll finish in the top two. I think they'll win the league, actually. But yeah, the, the so, yeah. team looked pretty well, cohesive, though. very together, very, very organised. You know, and, and that was a real pleasure to see that because, like, we've had a long time off, and, and the lads have like. I know they've kept the training up one thing or another, but you're not match fit, are you, until you're actually out there playing. Uh, and to put a performance on like that against the top of the league, mate, was, uh, well, boom, I went home happy. I thought, so how, I did, thought... How, how, how did it work for you, Darren? It's, you was at St Andrews watching it, weren't you? Commentating? Yeah, so um, as it works at the moment, I think <laughs> away team media, um, you're only allowed probably the very limited personnel there. So I think it was only like Colin Tatum and, and a few of the guys there from, from Blues and the media side. Uh, so, yeah, we were back at St. Andrews, empty St. Andrews, looking over the pitch, which is looking very nice, by the way. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, in a studio, having it streamed back. Um, very weird, but uh, no, I enjoyed it. <laughs> good, and good, good, great, good. great pleasure as well to see Roy, the club photographer, uh, right at the start of the game, yeah. Uh, the AM, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was my three-word review I saw, Roy. A few others saw him as well, but it was great to see him. Craig Courtney, if you're listening, get older, Roy. We need him on the show because he's taken over three million photographs of Birmingham City Football Club. Oh, over three wow. million. Over oh. three million. We need to have Roy on the show. Oh. Hey. Can we say a big welcome to the real star of tonight's show, Nat Peters? <laughs> sure. Long time no speak. Long time no speak. How you doing, um, Nat? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Just got to keep yourself busy at the moment, don't you? It's yeah, good to yeah. obviously have the football back. The only <coughs> sad thing about the football being back last week was the first game we all had to watch was them. Um, yeah. and, they, and it was a game they should have lost as well I mean how on earth that hasn't been given as a goal against Sheffield United I'll never know because you think if even if the um, goal on technology didn't go off you've got guys obviously watching the VR cameras surely they can get a message to the referee saying look this is a goal if that's yeah. the point if them up, I'll go absolutely rock solid mad I can't believe that <laughs> yeah well I think it's still they're still looking in a very precarious position um, because they've still got United still got Liverpool um, well, you look at Jeff. their looking their away fixtures. I don't see. Um, I don't Looks see where they're going to get the points from. Onto the decent football club in Birmingham. <laughs> <laughs> oh, smile yeah. on me back Saturday night, mate. You know, I know there was no supporters then. It's a bit weird listen, trying to listen in with the you know the fans on the uh, overlay on the TV over the it one thing or other. But just to get a game back, and you know, you know what, went, and to get this season finished, which was a right and proper thing to do, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it was great, wasn't it, to have football back and, you know, that feeling, you know, even though they were coming out to an empty stadium, it was still a nice feeling, wasn't it, to see the lads yeah. lined up, yeah. ready to play again? Carl, last time you was in with us, mate, I, I touched the foot that put the ball in the net, if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's earned me a good living, that left foot, so I can't complain. Good on you, mate, good on you. What a moment, what a super moment, not only for yourself, for like 18 years old, it was 18 years ago, and, um, you know, but for us supporters who had, who had just waited and waited and waited and, and we'd struggled so many times in the playoffs and one thing or other, uh, <laughs> to go up there, to go, well, to go down there, it was Cardiff, Norwich. And, uh, well, just to, to come home winning that game was like, I, I still smile about it now, 18, 18 years later. Yeah, I, I think uh, the club obviously re-showed the game, didn't they, four or five yeah. weeks ago, whenever it was. And um, yeah. the first time I'd actually sat down sort of a few days before and, and caught up on the, the previous three seasons. So um, you talk about the Worthington Cup the year before and obviously losing to Preston. Um, then you've got Watford game in the playoffs. You've got the Barnsley games in the playoffs before that. And it was just incredible. I mean, I don't obviously Cholton at home on that last day where Sasserilic in goal kept us out and we missed out on the playoffs. So the lead up to obviously 2002 was just um, full of... Literally, we were right there and it just needed that extra push to get us over the line. And uh, yeah, I think it was just one of relief, wasn't it, from from everybody, every blue nose. It was just an When you walked to that ball, to put that ball on that penalty spot at the age of 18, what really, I'll be dead honest with you now, what was going through your mind? You're 18 years old, crying out loud, I'd only just picked my first point up at that time, you know what I mean? I, I was supremely confident. And again, it seems weird um, now to sort of, you know, hear myself say it. Um, we practiced them and I'd, I'd sort of practice them all the way through uh, before the Millwall games um, leading up to, to Cardiff. Uh, I was just really supremely confident in, in taking a penalty. And um, even that day, uh, as silly as it sounds, when Jeff, uh, when Horse equalised, I just had this real overwhelming feeling we were going to win. Um, yeah. I didn't know how, you know, you, you just get that feeling, we, you know, this was going to be our game, it's going to be our time. So... I think, yeah, that confidence, uh, that belief, and just being, as you say, 18 years of age, uh, not really sort of getting 
to grips with what was at stake. Um, you know, you were you were in front of forty odd thousand Birmingham City fans, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you tell, and you tell me you weren't shaking. I'd have been letting me pass, mate. I'll be honest with you. I've, yeah, I've took penalties for, for Solly or Moores the last two, three seasons and felt more nervous. That's the God's honest truth. Um, <laughs> what? Of like, yeah, 1,500 fans. I mean, I the weird thing, I was going to say, the weird thing about that, actually, I think that confidence went through the team because if you look through our penalties that day, the four that we took, every mm. single one, Rob Green got near none of them. There was yeah. no scuffs that went in. All yeah. of them were straight and true in, in the corner, absolutely no bother whatsoever. Um, yeah. I mean, the only thing I was going to ask, Darren, how does it, how did it work in terms of how was it allocated? Who would take what penalty? Did you, did you volunteer? Were you told that you were? What was, what was the process behind that? Again, it was it, it was crazy, really, because if you remember, like, Tommy Mooney was our penalty taker that season. Yeah. He'd gone off. Um, so uh, I think as extra time finished, I knew Dev would take one. I knew Stan would take one, and Stern and Husey. They were the four. Um, so literally, I remember Mark Bowen coming up to me and just going. Uh, not even saying anything, we're just looking at me going four or five. Um, and I said, well, you know, who's it between? He went, it's you and Husey. And I said, well, ask Husey, you know, knowing full well, Husey always used to laugh and joke about always taking the fifth penalty. You know, he, he thrived on being sort of the pre- taking the pressure penalty. So, uh, yeah, Mark Bowen come back 30 seconds later. He just went five, uh, sorry, four, sorry, and, uh, and Husey's five. And that was it. Literally, uh, that's all was said. I stepped up and... And scored, and yeah, Husey to this day I always have a laugh and a joke. <laughs> and that I stole his thunder, so I said I'd give him the choice. So, best feeling ever, Durham, when that went in. If, if I could go back and relive any blues moment in my lifetime, that would be it. It was just for, for you as a blues fan taking that penalty for, as a blues fan in the stand, it was just unbelievable. It was, it, it was, was, it was, it wasn't unbelievable, it was art wrenching. It was, ab- yeah, I, I was it, telling oh, you, it, it was, it was, yeah, my, yeah, yeah, I mean, I was. Yeah, someone in front, someone sat in front of me had to tell me that that would have been the winner when you was walking up because I was just emotionally drained at the time. Yeah, um, I think everyone might like to say, I, I think the whole sort of, you know, the three previous seasons, that season as well, you know, we sort of, you know, had a bit of momentum going into the playoffs um, and all of a sudden we'd actually got to the final at last and, and of all things that was our nemesis was penalty shootouts, wasn't it, at that yeah. point? So yeah. Yeah, I just remember. I just remember going back to the Emerald Club after by the stage by the Blues Ground, mm. and seeing your dad sat there with probably about thirty pints in front of him, and he never paid for a single one. And he had such a great <laughs> night in there with us. It's, it's even today. Honestly, even today, Blues fans will buy my dad a pint um, based yeah. off, based off that day. So um, <laughs> you'll never turn it down. Obviously, so obviously oh. you know, but. Um, no. I was going to ask that, Darren. Have you or your dad actually bought a pint in Birmingham since? Or? <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is, like I say, and um, obviously my dad, yeah, I mean, he's he's obviously drinks in all the pubs, you know, all around the ground and all in Birmingham. And um, yeah, That don't sound good. That don't sound good, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> I need well, to meet you know, dad, Darren. I need yeah. to meet him. Hey, I need to meet him. <laughs> but that's the thing. Like, you talk about the penalty, and as soon as the penalty went in, and I, I ran off that side to the left of the goal... Because my dad was that side. Now, if you watch back, I'm just trying to look for him because I, I genuinely wanted to see his reaction. Because um, yeah. I knew, um, you know, he was the one I was looking for. Um, and yeah, uh, even after the, um, so after we celebrated on the pitch and we went back into the dressing room, if you watch on the the DVD and that um, when the sort of champagne and everyone started singing, you don't see me for for a good few minutes. I'm trying to get a signal in the in the shower area to phone my dad because I, literally I just wanted to. To speak to him just to get his reaction, um, just to see obviously, yeah, how he was feeling. But um, but yeah, like I say, he's he's done well off the back of it. He's uh, yeah, he's had a fair few points off it. Live question coming in for you, my friend, is uh, Leonard Edgington from our good, he's a good friend in Queensland in uh, Australia who gets up very early in the morning to watch every show. And now I've lost it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Good morning from yours truly in Queensland. 4.40 a.m. Hoping for a good show again. Good result against West Brom Jelby and keep right on. And uh, also Craig Courtney has posted on there on the on the pin one. Tonight, let's raise as much money as we can for Little Arthur. Send off. That's the link there to the GoFormy page. If there's anybody that can help join in uh, with that, then uh, we'd be only truly grateful. John Turland. Don't think I've ever held my breath for so long. <laughs> I'm still holding mine. Um, Daniel Ricketts, hi everybody on Tilton Talk and hi all at XST Blues. Hello to all our good friends at XST Blues. 
And thanks for listening with us tonight. Is Paul Hipkiss wearing that shirt for a dare or did he lose it as a bet from Adam Wilkes? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he said it, not me. He's been well, at home all the time. I was going to make for golf ball, but somebody else has. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart Rose and I was one of them right behind that goal. What a day. Keep right on. Apart from himself, who would Darren consider to have been the best penalty taker for Blues? Ooh, good question. Hi, Kill. On, on that day or in that squad, um, if I had to pick someone to take a pressure penalty, I would probably go Stan Lazaridis. Um, yeah. Just purely because I've never, I've never seen Stan miss a penalty. And I know he took one in, in the Preston game, the Worthington Cup. So... Um, and yeah, and he, he's a fellow left footer, so I've got to, I've got to stick with the left footers, and I. Mm. Yeah, great uh, player. Steve, Steve Portman from Accessi Blues wants to say thank you to everybody who has supported us with the face masks. If you get mine out, and I'll show everybody what they look like. And uh, Sterling job's been done on them. They look nice. They look good. They've got the blues badge on them. And uh, I should just show you exactly what they look like. Uh, Paul Hipkiss from Kevin Kelly uh, Blues TV actually worked after two days of tech trouble. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Your COVID-19 accessory blues mask. There you are. Uh, yeah, keep it on, Nick. It's a vast improvement. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not buy one, Chris? No, I don't need one. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Darren, Darren, talk us through... Um, you made your debut for us at West Brom away, didn't you? Yes, yeah. Talk, talk, us, talk us through what's going through your mind there. You're, you're obviously on, on the team coach on your way there. Did you know... Did You You didn't start, did you? You came on as a sub, yet? No, I started. I started Did the you game. start? Oh, yeah, okay. you started yeah. the game, yeah. Did you know that before on the on you know on the coach? No, so we'd uh, we'd gone to the hotel for pre match. Um it was only when I got into the dressing room, so I think it was about an hour and a half before the game. Um and Brucey named the team. I I'd later learned that he'd I think it was Julia Shelton, who was obviously secretary at the time. Um Jules had got in touch with my dad and basically said, Listen, Darren's gonna be making his debut. Um, make sure you're at the Hawthorne. So, yeah, my dad managed to to obviously go with my mom and all my uncles who were season ticket holders anyway. They all managed to get to the game. So, yeah, they knew before I did. <laughs> yeah, so how did, how did that feel? How did that feel when you found out? Uh, crazy, really. I'd, um, it was just sort of all... It all happened so quickly um, because, you know, it's been a, such a big game as well and been a night game uh, against West Brom. Um yeah, I just remember, you know, I think AJ played that night as well, Andy Johnson. And um, so that was sort of a bit of a calming effect for me, knowing I'd trained with AJ in the youth team and stuff. Um, and yeah, just literally, I just I remember starting the game and the atmosphere was electric, obviously. And I remember thinking in the first minute, Jason Roberts uh, for West Brom gave me a right elbow in the in the jaw about a minute in. And I thought, geez, is this what the men's game is all about? Is this what it's all about? Like, <laughs> Welcome to senior football. Exactly, yeah, but from then on, it was just, yeah, I was just into the game. And he, did, went did, so he score the win? did he score the winner yeah. that night, Jason Roberts? I think he did, yeah. I think he yeah. did, nil. Yeah, um, and I remember having a, a shot, a ball come out to the edge of the box in the second half to me, and I've, I've caught it sweet as anything, sort of, on the volley. And big Darren Moore um, got in the way, and I swear to this day, he unballed it. Um, in the box. Um, <laughs> if you watch on the if you watch on the video, the ball actually ricochets back to me, but I'm too busy remonstrating with the referee to to get onto the rebound. But um, yeah, the, the game just went just flew by. It just seemed like it was, you know, the, the whistle went for kick off, and all of a sudden it was full time. So, but I loved every minute. Yeah, yeah. Can, yeah. Can I remember us going. I remember us going on the bus as well from the Sedge Major. Remember that when you when you shut the doors at the back and we all went down the Blues on the bus from the Sedge Major. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I do. Yeah. <laughs> Like I say, I've just, I always say to people up until I was 21 and, and um, I moved on to West Brom, you know, my whole life was blues. Um, literally from from when I went down, my first game was in 1988 um, when I, you know, I, I, I stood in the back of the cop um, and all the way then, all the through to when I made my debut at 18, it was just, it was blues. Um, who, was your, who was your favourite player as a fan? <clears throat> Still, is it sad? When I first went down, my first game, for some reason, again, these days, kids would look at you and go, you know, why are you sort of a defender, your favourite player? But Ian Clarkson, um, yeah. I always, because yeah. he was captain at the time, obviously right back, and I, I used to love watching him, and mm -hmm. he became one of my favourite players. But it was him and Nigel Gleghorn, because then, obviously, yeah. Nigel Gleghorn was, was a goal-scoring midfielder. Um, I think, yeah, yeah. Clark is on next week, uh, Darren. I was, oh, there you go. Yeah. I've built a great build-up for him then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
got some more live questions. I think I've told him. I think I've told him already that uh, yeah, he was one. He was my favorite, well, one of my first Blues favorite players. So, um, but yeah, so uh, like I say, um, I remember them days. Yeah, go first going down. Uh, Kev Kelly wants to know what uh, Stan Stan Lazarid has done the Cobra celebration. Can you explain that one, Darren? You know what? <laughs> to, to this day, I'm not. I'm not really sure what the Cobra meant. Um, Stan would randomly do it in in, um, in tr- like training or in the dressing room. Uh, and the lads had laughed, but I, I never actually got the true meaning from it. So, um, <laughs> but every time he did it, he got he got a laugh. So I, I, I genuinely don't know what the what the meaning was. I think we're gonna have to find out. Uh, Pete Taylor, I've never seen so many grown men cry that day. I must say, guilty as charged. I was one of them, and I don't care. Uh, yeah, Brenda Brown, no, asked Darren, did he watch the Villa match, and how did he react when Chelsea scored? As all the blue noses was happy. <laughs> <laughs> I did watch the game. Um, <laughs> I actually, I actually missed the second goal. So I seen Chelsea equalise, and um, uh, I literally w- I went out the room, come back, and it was two one. Um, so I, yeah, I literally. But I, to be honest, though, you've mentioned it, Chelsea were very good. They look very good. I've, I've been impressed with them all season. So um, yeah, I, I did fancy them to win that game. John Turland wants to know, uh, looking at the club today, how do you rate the squad and the owners? I think squad, um, I've been super impressed this year, just purely off the um, how sort of together they've been, um, how hard working and the attitude. Um, I think at, at times this year they've played some great stuff. Um, and I think every game, there's no game I can I can think of where they've really sort of been out of it or um, haven't been competitive. Um, so, yeah, I've been hugely impressed. I think we've got some great individuals. Um and yeah, if you add a few few more to that mix or a bit of product mm. into that squad, I think we've got a, a real good chance. But um, as for the owners, again, um, <laughs> it's it's one of them. Um, it, it is. I think it's been a bit all over the place at times and uh, mixed messages. But um, I think now is the time, especially with Pep leaving after these next eight games, um, that's where they've got to really show uh, what they're all about and bring in the right man. I Absolutely, think... and Kevin Kelly wants to know, Darren, your thoughts on the next Blues manager? Well, again, I think, you know, Chris Shooting, having worked with him, um, I've done my rehab and uh, all my injury stuff uh, at Blues when I've done my adductor and Chris Shooting basically saved my career by allowing me to come in and train and, and do all my rehab. Um, so I've got a lot of respect for him. I think he's a fantastic coach. I know he's got a great reputation with players in the game as well. Um, so I'd love to see him back. Uh, I think he'd be great. For, for Blues and again an instant um, hit with the fans I know Lee Bowie has been mentioned um, so again young manager uh, is he quite ready um, for for a club like Blues to push us back into the Premier League you don't know so um, at a push I'd probably say Chris Shooting would be my, my favourite at the moment I think the big That's thing good. is who, whoever no, sorry, they appoint yeah, I was going to say no. Hang on. Last one for a second. Yeah. Uh, Darren uh, from Adam Wilkes, if you were in Jude's position, would you go to Dortmund or Man United? Uh, <laughs> it's it's crazy. I, I mean, um, I don't think he, it's a, a no lose situation. You know, two great clubs. <laughs> and, um, you know, Jude is, I mean, I, 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 it's hard not to rave about the kid or, you know, try and stay sort yeah. of lucky about him because he just who's his class to me, you know, on and off the pitch, you know, his maturity levels are, you know, are through the roof. Um, I think he's such a, you know, wonderful player and he's got, you know, huge potential, obviously. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you know, I think he's got the world at his feet, literally. Um, I think he could have his pick. Nat? Yeah, I was going to say, just back on the manager, I think whoever they get in, um, be it Hugh and Bowie or anybody else, this time they've got to allow the manager a, a better degree of control over the team, especially over transfers as well. Um, whoever yeah. comes in now, it doesn't matter who they get in if they're not allowed to actually do the job to the best of their ability. Um, so that's, on, that's the only thing that that's the only thing that worries me, um, especially with someone like Chris Hutton, who's worked here previously with, tri- with what were tricky owners, um, tricky sort of CEO. Would he come back into that sort of situation? And would any manager of any mm-hmm. sort of merit really come into a situation where they're not necessarily going to be in control of team affairs? Mm. Yeah, I think I think that's like any club. I think you know a manager. If you appoint a manager, and and if you're a manager coming into a football club, you want to be able to do your job basically um, on the recruitment side and on building a squad. So um, yeah, and I think that's again if Chris Shooting is the man, you know he's got a past experience of 
of you know the dealings here and how it operates. Um, so at least you'll have the heads up if you like. Yeah. Just a question about um, team managers. Go on, Nick. Do you think it's a question of owners wanting to be managers? <laughs> I think there is some out there definitely who you know they see it as um, you know they do fancy themselves as you know a, a bit of a manager as you say and. Um, you do see them them scenarios, don't you? And they can't help yeah. get involved. When, 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 when I was a kid back in the seventies, when I was a kid back in the seventies, we didn't even know who the chairman was. Yeah, you know and what I, mean? I, I feel I think that's how it should be. Like you say, the owners should be in the background. Um, yes, and again, maybe some of them need to people to know that they're the the main men and what have you. But still, allow manage you appoint people, you know, managers to come in to manage the football team. You know, you manage the club, um, give him everything that he needs to be successful. That is what a, a good owner should do, I think. Yeah, I mean, so right. give, give him their due. I mean, um, they get they get criticised for a lot of other things, but the last owners who actually really did that at the Blues, who didn't really instil, were probably Gold and Sullivan. Obviously, Karen, Karen Brady ran the business side of things day to day, but the manager was allowed to be the manager, mm-hmm. pick the players, pick who came in, who left the club. And now, now it's obviously past 10 years or so, it's been kind of just been voices from above him from the Carson Young days where managing is told to sign players, mm. pick certain players. Not And what will get to me with anything is with the current ownership, they seem to have an idea where they want the club to play a type of football that isn't necessarily suited to the squad of players that we've got. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really does worry me um, because I think that's the last thing a manager wants to be told to get results by playing like Barcelona when ne- not necessarily it's the best way to set our team up. No, exactly. Mm-hmm. Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything <clears throat> everyone's just said there. Um, you know, unfortunately, there has been a bit of interference from above on the football side of things, which has held us back. And you know, if they don't change their what, you know, if they don't change that, in my opinion, we're just never going to go anywhere. You know, you could potentially put the best manager in the world in charge, but if he's not allowed to get on with his job and do it to the best of his abilities, like Nat said, then even even with him in charge, we might struggle. You know. I think it's a norm these days, though. It's it seems to be the norm. A lot of clubs are um, like seem to be coached by the manager, the, the you know the owners and so forth. I suppose everybody wants their five minutes of fame, Chris, don't they? You know what I mean? Mm. Mm. I think but you can't expect. You, you, I mean, what's the old you know insanity? He's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, I think the days because the way football clubs are run now, the days of a manager running things top to bottom um, are probably in the distant past, but I still think there's a fine balance to be struck there where you've got to give a manager a degree of autonomy over the players, Mm -hmm. over how the team sets up, because otherwise, what's he there for? Mm -hmm. What's the point of even having him there in the first place? Exactly. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. agreed. What, Marino? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So what are you doing with today's carts? Yeah, just a little Solly or Moores. Um, So uh, obviously off the... The back of the season being void in the National League and um, a bit disappointing, really, because we were a, a point outside the playoffs um, and with a game in hand. But obviously, the way that the points per game system has worked out, we fall to, I think it's eighth or ninth. So we don't make the playoffs. Um, so season over and it, it's looking towards next season now. You've got uh, Mitch Hancock there now, haven't you, as well? Yeah, we've got Mitch there. Um, so uh, Mad, Mad Mitch. Um, is he doing all right? Yeah, still left yeah, back. Yeah, he's, he's all good. Yeah, Mitch is. You know, he's he's sort of left back slash left side. At Macclesfield, to be fair, he he sort of pushed further forward. He was like a left of a, a front three there, and he yeah. plays in midfield as well. Is uh, he a Solio? He's a Solio lad, isn't he? As well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mitch is from Solio. Alton, I think. So, I mean, just running. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Mate, Mitch is pretty much yeah. Five minutes from me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lives and breathes blues. So um, yeah, it's good to good, good to have him. Good lad. Good stuff, good man. <laughs> so we've got we've got some we've got some questions from our from some of our viewers from in the week if that's okay. Um, yeah. So just uh, we just put it out there to to put any questions on the on the shout box and we ask them obviously when the show starts. So firstly, Stephen Gill's asking you, Darren, um, what was it like to play in your first Blues Villa derby? I, I was talking about this the other day actually, um, and it was because uh, I uh, I was talking again about the lead up to to that game so it was 2002 wasn't it yeah these the Enkel, uh, yeah it was the Enkelman game yeah. wasn't it yeah. um so I wasn't actually in the squad that day um but before that even as a fan uh, the only sort of uh, game I'd, I'd seen Blues Villa was the Rumbelows Cup I think it was 93 yeah um, <laughs> I, I, and that's it like so 10 years it was 10 years since I'd, I'd you know experienced the Blues Villa and then to be 
sort of, you know, pitch siding in and around the squad. Um, it was crazy. And I mean, obviously that night at St Andrews was was bonkers, wasn't it? You know, yeah. The, the first, yeah. The first one you played in was 05, wasn't it? The 2 0. No, so I played in the the following game of, uh, of that season, the first season, which was the Robbie Savage doubling game. I actually came on for oh. Savage. Um, and again, that, that night at Villa Park was just absolutely <laughs> mental, crazy. Um, I couldn't even warm up. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the linesmen um, are literally, I think, uh, well, them days you warmed up the subs, warm up the same side as the linesman. He was the halt end end. So... Um, Brucey, I think, said to me about 25 minutes to go, go and warm up. And I've looked up and, you know, you can see the Villa fans are trying to get on the pitch. It was, <laughs> and I'm literally edging going, I'm, I'm going to get lynched down there. You know, I'm, you know, the fact that I'm a Blues player, I'm a Blue nose as well. Um, yeah. So Brucey looks at me again, sort of like angry, like, what are you doing? I, I just sort of pointed and he said, all right, stay here, have a stretch here. Um, and I ended up coming on for Sav in that game. Um, for okay, the last yeah. 15 minutes, yeah. Well, yeah, I was going to yeah, say, yeah. Sav, probably, Sav probably had to come off for his own safety, didn't he, towards the end of that game? He wasn't, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't yeah, safe to still be playing. <laughs> well, we had Sav on last week, and uh, what an open yeah. and frank, honest interview that was. And I've got, I've got to thank him for his honesty last week, because he was absolutely straight with us, wasn't he, Chris? He was oh, right yeah. bang down on oh, everything yeah. he said. You know what? And, and, and to receive the apology like we did last week, credit to the man, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, beforehand, yeah, yeah, I said that he'd say to me, was it, was, is there anything you don't want us to talk about? He went, nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he was bang on. He was straight to the point with it and very honest with it. And I, I appreciate that genuinely. Yeah. 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 Um, Carl Sparrow's asking, who was your football hero um, as a kid growing up? That was from Ryan, age eight. He's his Jude Bellingham. So Ryan AJ is asking you who is who is your who was your football hero growing up? I think you've kind of touched upon it earlier, haven't you? Yeah. So um, again, my dad was uh, a huge fan of Brian Robson. Um, mm. So growing up, and and obviously me sort of moulding into a midfield player and getting box to box. My dad always used to say to me, you know, watch Brian Robson. Um, mm. And then as I got a little bit older, Zinedine Zidane was was a player. Oh. Then that I was what a player he was. Yeah, yeah. Just you weren't bad, was it? No, really. oh, it was amazing. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, even now, you know, you'll see clips of of what he done, and and it, again, like talking to the younger generation about Zidane, some of them who you know probably missed his career only just, and just saying this guy was a as a, was a wizard, you know, just as yeah, yeah. Bit of I'd put him on a par. I'd, I'd put Zidane on a par with Ronaldo and Messi. I would in that sort of category. Yeah, one hundred percent technique wise and everything. Um, yeah. So yeah, obviously two different types of midfield players, if you like, but um. And then, yeah, I, again, something that I'm extremely proud of in my career that Brian Robson actually then signed me as a player. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, yeah. a proud moment as well. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, and, go on. So, go on. I was just going to say, Jason Hughes is asking, um, he read that you got sent off for fouling Cristiano Ronaldo in a Youth World Cup in 2003. <laughs> did Ronaldo die or did he actually, did you actually touch him? <laughs> <laughs> in all fairness, right, I, I, again, um, he got he got put down as Cristiano Ronaldo. He played in the game, um, and he was at, at Sporting Lisbon at the time, and well talked about even at that stage. But um, I'm not even, I'm not quite sure. I don't think it was him. In the, it was one of them. It was sort of a bit of a uh, middle of the park, a couple of players, and I've gone sort of to, to ground to win the ball. I think I actually won the ball. You know, it was a bit of a meaty challenge, and um, the the foreign referee, I think he was Italian, um, straight red, and it was never ever a straight red. It was it was farcical really. Um, but then later on, it was said it was it was on Cristiano. So um, I thought, oh, it's not 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 a bad news story to have linked to your name. But um, if I'm going to get sent off, uh, why not why not for fouling Cristiano? Um, but the only downer on that day was that I was actually captain. <laughs> uh-huh. I was captain in the team, and uh, I got sent off. So yeah, not not my finest moment. Darren, when you were playing against him that day, obviously it was. A- a youth team sort of tournament, but could you tell even then that he was a standout a cut above above everybody else on the pitch? Did, could you? Yeah, he, he was. He was talked about before the game that um, Manchester the United um, speculation had already started. So yeah. I think it was pretty much you knew we knew he was going there. Um, and yeah, it, it just literally they got the ball to him at every opportunity they could, and he was just yeah, he was very very good. Obviously dribbling and obviously the early. Early Cristiano, if you remember, he was very sort of like everything was a trick, everything was you know a step over, um, and you could tell he was going to be he was going to be special. 
Yeah. Mm, good mm. stuff. Mm. Then was it the Any best player you've ever played against? Yeah, yeah. Um, just a couple from me, really. Um, was was, was Ronaldo, I presume Ronaldo was the best player you ever played against, was he? Or yeah, and, and, and I said obviously when we got promotion to the Premier League that that first year in in um, our first game was obviously Arsenal away at Highbury. So you had Henri playing, you had Bergkamp, Vieira, Petit, uh, Ashley Cole, um, and then obviously when we played United, it was the midfield was Beckham, Scholes, Keane, and Giggs. So I was I was extremely extremely lucky um, for them first couple of seasons in the Premier League with Blues that we. We played against some of the Premier League finest players, you know, Gerard, Lampard. Uh, yeah. Yeah, some real special players, yeah. We Makes you think what they'd be worth. Makes you wonder what they'd be worth today, doesn't it? Well, yeah, obviously the, the transfer market now is um, rocketed, hasn't it? So, yeah, some of these players. I mean, we talk about Zidane. I mean, Zidane would be, like you say, in the Messi, Ronaldo category, wouldn't he? So, oh, easy. Yeah, Darren. What yep. was that step up like from the Championship to the Premier League? What was, was it? Was it a really big gap? You know what? I, I think um, I always found the Championship that first season, uh, and then even previous seasons when I when I dropped back down, um, that uh, it was always very physical. Always the tempo was a lot higher in the Championship. When you got to the Premier League, um, it was a lot more technical, um, and I always felt like you got a little bit more time on the ball. But when you give it away. You know, you, you wouldn't get it back for, you know, three or four minutes. Or if you made a mistake, you got punished. Um, mm. So you always knew, you could always see that level, um, uh, you know, above. Um, and that, yeah, you, you, you very rarely got away with mistakes and uh, you had to retain the ball. And mm. I'm, guessing, I'm, I'm guessing by a mistake, it doesn't necessarily mean a glaring error where you've missed the ball or you've, if you're a keeper, you've let it under your, like if you're a midfield, I'm guessing a mistake simply could be letting someone out your sight for a split second. And they're coming yeah. in. Like, so I'm guessing the level is more that you've got to be switched on constantly. 100%. I always remember we played, I think, Chelsea the first season uh, in the Premier League. And um, I played in the game. And, and obviously, Lampard, obviously, all through his he made a career in the of them late runs yeah. into the box. And I remember playing in the game. And, and for about sort of, you know, half an hour, I sort of tracked him and made sure that, you know, it stays pretty much in front of him. And then that one split second, I lost him and I think they had a real good chance from it. Um, yeah. And I remember thinking to myself then, wow, you switch off for a, for a minute, you know. Yeah. Uh, I've played it so well for half an hour, but that 30, 31st minute, all of a sudden, <clears throat> he's got him behind me and I haven't, hadn't even realised it. So, yeah, that was, you could see that that was the, the step up. Definitely. What, was it like, what was it like playing against the Blues as Tim Croucher Faraday? Oh, <laughs> The, the weirdest thing ever, um, because then I, I made my West Brom debut against Blues in that game at the Hawthorne. So, um, it, yeah, it was just really weird. That's probably the best way I can put it. You know, looking over and seeing all the Blues fans in the away end mm. and just thinking, you know, there's me with a West Brom kit on. Um, I and it, was, it, was, it was weird, really, really weird. And even after that, then when I came back and played uh, again, you know, West Brom at St Andrews and then Preston, um, yeah, it was just always really, really weird situation. Didn't, didn't quite feel right. Hmm. Were, you, were, was, were you wary? Nat. I was going to say, were you wary when you went to West Brom? Were you wary actually about moving across to a local rival? Did that not really come into it when you were? Um, not at first, really. And, and again, uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, what how the move come about. And I remember in that summer, I'd, I'd, I'd come back. So that previous season, I'd been at Sunderland on loan. Um, I'd come back then the second half of the season and played then at Blues. Um, and during the summer, then Mick McCarthy, because Sunderland went up um, to the Premier League, Mick McCarthy wanted to take me back on loan for the year. And I think Brucey had half sort of agreed that. Um, and then uh, Brom Robson came in, uh, obviously for West Brom, for a permanent deal. Um, and in my mind, I always felt at Blues that I was always going to be the young the youngster, um, the previous few seasons, the first few seasons in the Premier League, I understood that more experienced players like Robbie Savage, Alu Cisse, Stephen Clements, all these guys would come in and, and probably get the nod over me. Um, but yeah, that was the one thing, you know, with, with Brucey that I thought, I think he always seen me as the young lad. Um, and I wasn't confident that I'd ever sort of shed that tag. Um, so that was a lot, you know, played in a lot for me moving away and, and sort of, starting my journey elsewhere because as I mentioned earlier up until that stage I've just been blues all the way through I don't mm. think for one minute right that I've ever ever 
pulled on somebody else's football shirt, right? What was that feeling like in the dressing room? You know, you're a blue nose through and through. You've got to put a baggy shirt on. <laughs> Again, I was, it was just, uh, for me, it was like a fresh start, if you like. Um, and it was, it was new. Um, obviously, I'd been at Sunderland anyway for six months. And, and, yeah, but know, what about the badge? What about the badge? There's, wor- there's worse shirts you could have put on, Daz. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, but it's, it's football, isn't it? I think, you know, I was just buzz- buzzing to be somewhere and, and playing for a manager like I say, Brian Robson. It was a yeah, no, get that, yeah. moment for me. So, um, it, yeah, it, I think as a player, that's one thing I always try and say. Um, you know, when fans, you know, obviously your loyalties as a, as a fan will never waver. But as a player, I think you do need to, to sort of have a different mindset sometimes because, you know, you go to different clubs and you want to do well personally anyway um, and you have to sort of put allegiances and loyalties aside a little bit and, and focus on your football and, and that's yeah. probably a good job of a footballer then to be honest with you <laughs> <laughs> so who was the um, who was the best player you ever played with in your whole career I mean Christoph Dugar is probably yeah. you know yeah, yeah he's he's got to be top of the list um, even at West Brom you know was a special talent to play play alongside yeah yeah. Um, even striker-wise, Kevin Phillips um, was a yeah. you know, one of the best finishers. Um, but again, I'd say Mikel Forsal was definitely up there in terms of finishers that I played with. Uh, but in, in terms of all-round player and, and what he'd done in the game and, and everything, um, and Christoph was just such a, a great guy. I sat next to him in the changing room at Blues in the training ground, and um, he was just a, such a down-to-earth, humble guy, um, which <clears throat> again endeared you to him even more. Mm. Yeah, he was, you know, for that first six months he was with us. At times he was unplayable, weren't he? I mean, the Southampton game always sticks in my mind. He was just probably the best ever individual performance I've ever seen in it from anyone yeah. in a blue shirt that day. Yeah. He, he sort of transformed us a little bit, didn't he? We, we were always going to be that hard-working, you know, honest group of guys. But then to add that bit of magic to the squad just, you know, um, was the reason that we, you know, we finished in the top half. Yeah, exactly. I think on Christoph, he's one of the very few, and definitely the first, but one of the very few in my lifetime, where genuinely you could say that he could play for Man United or Real Madrid and he wouldn't look out of place. Yeah, he was that sort of level. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if there maybe, I don't know if maybe his focus is all there at times with the Blues or generally in his career, because I think if he if he really had been focused totally on football, he probably wouldn't have been playing for Blues, would he? Um, yeah. But for that for that six months, his art seems to be really in it, mm-hmm. um, and he he didn't keep us up single handedly, but he did a lot towards actually keeping us up, and then. That second season when he signed permanently, he just didn't seem that as with it really. I don't know what I don't know what happened there. Was he could he not settle or was he just was it something off the pitch or? I don't know. I think uh, again, um, as you know, when you're in the dressing room and that with him, you, you didn't see a change in him, sort of you know, de- demeanour wise. Um, I think at first, I think he realised very quickly just how um, happy everyone was that he'd come to, to the Blues. You know, not only was us as players and staff, but fans. You know, I think he yeah. was really. Took took back by how you know how much love he was shown, um, and yeah, you could probably call it a sort of a honeymoon period if you like. Maybe that you know inspired him even more to to play his best football in that early six month period. Um, but yeah, there's no doubt in his, his ability on a you know daily basis in training was just yeah it was mm. a, a joy. I've to got, be around. Sorry, mate. I've got one more question as well from Siobhan Kennedy. Um, so you've talked about talked before about how much being a blue nose meant to you or means to you. Um, but when you wanted to come back and play for us, um, why was you told they wouldn't re-sign you? So oh, so when I, that's, yeah, when you came back for that second spell, because you played so, in a couple of pre-season games, didn't you? Yeah. So the, the way it worked out was my my contract finished at Preston, um, and uh, they wanted to re-sign me. Phil Brown was manager at the time, and. Um, he was having problems with the chairman there and getting to, trying to sign players and um, I'd give up my apartment up there up north so I was back in Birmingham and I pretty much said to him you know the, the travelling is, is sort of you know is killing me at the moment and uh, my agent said that he'd been in touch with Chris Hewitton and he said come in and, and train if you want so I went in and trained um, was there I think it was nearly six or seven weeks and and Chris Hewitton, in all fairness to him, um, I can't remember at the time, uh, the, the couple of players he was trying to move on. And he said, listen, you know, there, there might be a year here for you. So obviously I stuck around. And, but he got to a point where he was struggling to get them players out. Obviously the season had started and I needed to be playing. Um, so yeah, I ended up yeah. him and training at Nottingham Forest um, under Co- Steve Cottrell, of all people, um, and playing in a game at their training ground uh, behind closed doors and I ended up... Uh, um, tearing my duct tape in that game yeah. and put me out for three oh. 
come on. So I was out of contract. And then going back to what I said about Chris Hewton, he said, come back to Blues. The physios there, Pete and Dave, who are still there today, um, literally looked after me. I had my operation and did all my rehab there. And Nick Davis, uh, who's actually at, um, at West Brom now, the fitness guy, he'd done everything with me. And then I come back and, and trained. And then the pre the season after that, um, obviously I wasn't signed and Lee Clark was manager. And it was a bit a bit of pretty much the same sort of um uh problem that he had. He had obviously a lot of players and he was saying to me, like, you know, he'd done the same. I think it's was it Newcastle or Sun uh in the Newcastle. He'd played there early in his career and then sort of gone back or tried to go back. Um, and he said, I sympathise with where you are. Um, he said, but I've you know, got a couple of things that I need to do first and got yeah. sort of certain people on our radar. Um, so, yeah, it didn't quite happen. But, um, so, yeah, I think the injury the first year under Chris Hewton was what sort of, um, yeah, put the, the return to Blues, the dream, um, yeah, into the, into the dust. Mm. 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 Sure. I got one for you. Here we go. Ready? Go on, man. You are a West Bromwich Albion player. <laughs> you are a Birmingham <laughs> You put a West Bromwich Albion shirt on and you're playing against the Blues. Mm. Who do you really want to win? <laughs> <laughs> He's a professional <laughs> first. <laughs> yeah. Can I say a draw? Can I say, can I say, say a <laughs> Proper on the spot, that is, isn't it, man? Oh, uh, yeah. It's... It, it's one of them, like I say, you know, I, I wanted as a player, I wanted to win every game. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, as much as obviously, you know, my love for Blues will, will never waver if I'm in a game and it's, you know, my yeah. team. What you relegated us? <laughs> What's that? What if you always relegated us? I'll probably, I'll probably have a, a bit of a hamstring uh, that day. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be able to play. It'll be a sore, sore hamstring, yeah. I can't, can't, can't go, go to the ball, <laughs> Well, I was I was I was about to say that I think the season you went to the Albion that season Blues and Albion obviously they ended up both going down. Yeah. So yeah. obviously potentially every win that you I mean it didn't really matter in the end because we obviously both did go but every win that you got for the Albion was probably one step close to sending us down. So it must that must have been a bit weird as well. You you're probably winning the games at the Albion every now and then, then coming in and checking the Blues score. And if yeah. you realize you put us further in the trouble. Yeah, like you say, it's crazy. Again, as as a player, you're just sort of trying to focus on on what you're doing at you know and what we were doing at West Brom. But um yeah, when you look back, it was kind of like, yeah, we were, we weren't doing either either of ourselves favours were we that season. So Yeah. It is what, what it is. Your, um Darren, what was your favourite goal for us apart from that penalty? Um it's quite, it's crazy, really. My first goal, and obviously my first career goal, was with my right peg against Crew at home. Um, mm. and, and then I, I always enjoyed the goal I scored at Fulham against Van der Sar, where again with my right peg, it sort of fell yeah. up and I've hit it back across into the net. Um, so yeah, and I scored one against at home against Tottenham, which was more of a toe yeah. poke. But um, when you watch it back, it looks like I've I've sort of dribbled through about three players, but. The ball kind of ricochets quite nice for me, but it, it looks like I'm messed for a minute. Um, I end up getting my toe in front, of, uh, yeah, in front of Ledley King and poking it home. And they ended with, uh, that was the equaliser that day. So, um, so yeah, I, I can say, well, every every goal I score for Blues, I can I can remember fondly. You got the brace, the brace against Leeds in the cup as well. I remember that. Yeah, yeah another right pegger. So, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's quite lethal with my right peg. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, like I say, um, that was a good day. I really enjoyed that game. That's a, uh, a game that obviously, you know, uh, I, I felt like I was sort of could run all day and we won the game, was it 3-0 in the end? Um, yeah. Against a decent lead side as well. They had a good side that day and um, yeah, that was enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. So you got any funny stories you can tell us? I always ask these. Um, so any pranks you can tell us um, on air and who was the best and worst dresser in the blue squad that you was in? And who was the best and worst trainer? And don't forget, as far as the prank goes, right, it's on air. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's live. We're talking it's like live. the day. This is, this is 18, 18 years ago now. Um, going to, to trainer, I've got to start with trainer. Uh, best trainer, Brian Hughes, by an absolute country mile. Really? Well, probably yeah. in my career, one of the best trainers I've seen. Um, and then worst, I mean, loved him to death, but Olivia Tebbley. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Teb's, one of, Teb's one of the training ground guy to be fair um, come match day though if you give him a task to do we do it um, yeah yeah they would be I mean best best and worst dressed oh god I mean fashion back then 
was 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 questionable, wasn't it? Um, Gary. I know mean, Christoph, Christoph do Gary. In all fairness to him, he was probably ahead of his time. He was wearing you know his shirts and his jeans, cut you know cut off jeans and his shoes, and um, so he, he always he always looked the part. To be fair, and he had the long hair, didn't he, and the beard? Yeah. So he, you know, he always looked at the part and the the, the accent. Um, worst wreck. <laughs> Oh, I don't want to offend anyone here. Um, We're just curious. Does it, you might say some somebody who's been mentioned quite a quite a bit. So. Quite a bit. <laughs> oh God. Um, off the top of my head, I can't really think. Like I say, the, the fashion back then now to think about it, you know, it, even me, I was wearing baggy jeans and all sorts back then. Um, I still am. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll probably put Tebs in there. I don't want to mention him twice, but. <laughs> Um, Tebs was very outrageous with some of the stuff he wore um, and yeah off the top of my head and yeah, we had I'll tell you who we had as well we had uh, Tommy Williams as well um, who obviously yeah. came to the club and, and yeah I mean he, he he spent a lot of money on his on his gear he, he took a bit of a pride in it um, and yeah I don't think it really hit the spot with a lot of the lads so he, he took a, a fair bit of stick and a funny story is Phil, our boot boy. Um, I think Phil, I know Phil's still there now, and Phil, um, he always marks up your trainers. So you, you tra- obviously trainers that you use for the gym and, and running outside. And uh, Tommy's first, Tommy Williams' first day in, uh, he bought in these really flash trainers. He paid about 150 quid for them. Phil's gone in while we're out training, marks them up, <laughs> marks them up like TW20. On these spanking oh, hundred fifty pound trainers, really, mate. and uh, yeah, and t- Tommy thought he was one of the lads. He thought he genuinely thought one of the lads had just, you know, <laughs> and he's, he's like, it was it was Phil, the the boot guy. He literally thought he was thought he was your uh, your running trainer. <laughs> uh, Got one for you, Darren. Right now, the last time I saw Tom Ross was on the last game that we had at St Andrews. Yeah, uh, and I met him outside, and uh, we were having just chatting away, chatting away. And I know he hasn't asked this question, but I know he would ask this question if I'd seen him yesterday. Yeah. And it would have been, has Darren still got that bloody hell is mad? <laughs> <laughs> He's only jealous. Tom's only jealous. I always say to him, he gives me loads of stick about that. Well, Tom gives me stick about a lot of things. Um, my hair is always the, probably the first topic that he goes to. Um <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he still sees me as that 18 year old with me sort of gelled fringe and short hair short back and sides so um, yeah he, he, I don't think he yeah, he realises I'm sort of say twice twice that age now and I've got a beard and long hair <laughs> let's have a show how long is it how long is it oh it's yeah. it's, it's quite pretty long, long yeah. it's, uh, got a bit of a leap oh, going oh. there <laughs> is the Christoph do Gary? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Crikey, that, that is what I was going for. <laughs> that's Chris. That's Christoph Dugri and Mara Zarati added together, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> look, look and weep, Paul Hipkiss. <laughs> oh no! Yeah, imagine, imagine me with that hair. <laughs> <laughs> and now, a few oh. a few days ago, um, Darren, we asked you uh, uh, to pick your one to eleven with the players that you've played with. Blues. Yes. Go on then. <laughs> well, I mean, starting with keeper, it was it was it was hard really because um, Benno and Bennett came to mind straight away, but um, that was more because obviously I'd, I'd grew up, uh, you know, a season ticket older and Benno had been there so long, and then I actually got to to train and and play with Benno. But at the time, then sort of Nico Vassin had come in and, and had took the number one spot. Uh, but then we had Mike Taylor. Um, so I actually played more games with Mike than I did Benno. So I ended up going with Mike um, just purely on the games that I, I'd played with him. But Benno's one of my all-time favourite Blues players anyway. So, uh, yeah. yeah, Mike got the nod in terms of games played with him. Um, back four was probably pretty standard, really. Right back, Mario Malchiot. Um I think Mario was just, just dude's class, you know, when he came in. And again such a, a great guy. I remember a funny story. I was in LA with my partner a couple of years ago, just walking down some random street in LA. I get a shout and it's Mario. He was just at a coffee shop over the road, literally. <laughs> and I'd actually had my hair out long. So how he recognised me, I'll never know. Um, but I'd had interactions with him on Twitter and stuff and, and everything um, sort of leading up. But yeah, so I got to, to see him. Um, but yeah, he was just fantastic. Obviously, come you know, great pedigree from Ajax and Chelsea and everything. Um, 
and then the two centre halves was was Kenny Cunningham and uh, Matty Upson as a pairing. I think you know we we'll probably all agree that they were fantastic at yeah. to the Premier League and were real sort of the the rock solid base that we needed. Um, and both were great. Kenny especially. I mean, Kenny was was fantastic for me um, as a young lad and obviously trying to make my way. Um, his experience and his advice um, was was second to none. And he kept me out of the card schools on the on the coach as well, where all the money was going. He'd keep me at the back with him and, and Matty Upson and we'd play, play hearts and cards for no money. So uh, he probably saved me a fair, fair bit of cash um, on away trips. So them two at the back, yeah. Uh, left back, Grange. I don't think you know that was that was a no brainer. Grange was yeah. just, yeah, yeah. Again, fantastic servant for the club um, and great guy. Absolutely love Grange to death. Um, midfield was was a little bit bit tougher. Um, again, Stan. I've already mentioned him. Stan Lazaridis was, you know, um, a great guy. Great to play with um, on and on, on and off the pitch. Um, helped me a lot as well as a young player, sort of his advice and everything. And one thing with Stan was he had great financial advice as well. He was like a uh, a financial advisor you didn't have to pay. Um, he, uh, <laughs> he, yeah, I think uh, I'm right in saying he owns his own company now in Australia. I think I'm yeah, right in saying yeah. Well, you don't surprise me. Stan was just yeah, full of knowledge. Um, and yeah, just such a, a great guy. And again, you know, great servant for Blues and a very good. <clears throat> um, Husey um, as well. Husey was obviously my central midfield partner when I first got in the team and, and actually sacrificed a lot for me because we all knew Husey was a, a goal scoring midfielder, got into the box, arrived, uh, arrived late. Uh, but when I got into the team, obviously I was box to box and I was just a hundred miles an hour and Husey had to sort of sit in a little bit and be a bit more sort of um, defensive. Um, so he changed his game for me. Um, but again, you know, as I mentioned in training every day, he's, you know, his talent and his, Ability was was there, you know, to see. Um, and David Dunn, I mean, Dunny was one of them that uh, it was probably one of the first players that I played with that I felt like he made me better um, because he was such an intelligent player. Um, I always felt like if you know I made a run, like I mentioned, you know, I was box to box hundred miles, and I always wanted to get in the box. But Dunny was he had the vision, he had the awareness to to see uh, see a run, see you know, and pick you out. Um, and yeah, yeah, again, bags of ability. Um, and then f- had to go front three, really. Um, Christophe Dugarry, for obvious reasons, as we mentioned. Um, Mikhail Forsal, again, talked about, I mean, one of the best finishes I've ever played with. Just natural finishing, goal scoring was, you know, you talk, I've talked about Kev Phillips, but it's just they pick up naturally very good positions in the box, just natural born goal scorers. And then it was, again, a real... Uh, toss up between um, Jeff Horsfield and Stern John. Um, Horse, I always felt Horse was always going to get, he scored important goals, obviously. Um, was great to play with because of his work rate and his unselfishness. Um, and then Stern, to be fair, I mean, Stern came to the club sort of the same time I made my debut. So um, I played a lot of games with Stern um, and he scored a lot of goals as well. So it, it was hard to choose. I went with Stern just again. Probably on, I played more games with him, um, but yeah, Horse was very close, close to that. Good uh, team, captain. Yeah, great team. Who's your captain? captain? Oh, I didn't pick captain, did I? Uh, it's got to be Kenny, Kenny Cunningham. Uh, just yeah, again, natural born captain, natural born leader. Yeah, quality player. <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Brown, what time are we going till? Uh, I don't mind going to a quarter two if you like. Quarter two. Yeah, okay, yeah. we'll make it a quarter two. Uh, okay, it's, it's uh, Birmingham City versus Hall. Uh, with an empty stadium. <laughs> we'll go. Um, this coming Saturday, can we have your predictions, please? We'll start off with Nat Peters. Well, Hull, Hull are in disarray by the looks of things. Um, I, think, I think they've had a lot of issues off the pitch with players leaving um, before the season's out. Um, they've not they've been, they've been in terrible form. So it's the sort of game that we usually mess up. Uh, but I think... On, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I, on paper at the moment, I'd, I'd put us down for a win. I'd say probably 2-0. Superb. OK, can I just interrupt there? And a really important message is coming for Darren. Uh, it's from Lee Fothergill. Hi, Darren. Could you say hello to my lad, Carter, who's named after you? Oh, wow. And also say hello to your dad for me, for the love of art. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Uh, very humbling to know that uh, I was someone was named after me. So, yeah, 
Huge hello and thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, right, OK, uh, Paul, your show. Blues Hall. I'm going to go 1-0. One 1-0 nil. One nil Blues. Nat, Nat, sorry, what was yours again, mate? 2-0. Uh, Open and Duke. 1-0 one, one one from Paul. Yeah, 1-0 from me, yeah. OK, Mrs Brown. Yeah, uh, I'm the same. It's a game, it looks like we should win, but... Yeah, no, I think we'll nick it 1-0. And Darren? I'm going to go 2-1 Blues. I'm going to go 2 0 along with Mr. Peters, and I think the pitch is going to play a massive part in that because it does look like velvet. It looks absolutely superb. What an incredible job them guys have done on that pitch during this lockdown. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Mm. Uh, Linda's gone 3 1. Leonard's gone a 3 1. Ray's gone 3 0. Paul has gone 2 0. Mandy's gone 2 1. And Steve Portman's gone 4 1. Uh, has Linda gone 6 0? Sorry? Has Linda gone six nil? No, 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 shh, no. Forgot, she's forgot about that. Uh, Brent, <laughs> <laughs> Brenda's gone two one, and Sharon's right. gone Aaron. two one. Well, Neil, Aaron, be a good time to do that, Chris. If, if, if we score six this season, right? Yeah, Chris has got to do the show with no clothes on. <laughs> You'd be all right there, though. I could be naked now, really, apart from this t-shirt. <laughs> 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 and uh, and Linda has a, has a 50 pence bet on every game 6-0 every week oh, no. it's come close so, it's come close hasn't it well we did score 6 because we did uh, that, that one game of penalties didn't we yeah it didn't count yeah it would have done if I'd had my way <laughs> no no it didn't count so rule 6 paragraph 3 stroke 4 <laughs> so Daz what, 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 what's next for you now Daz obviously you've still got your you've got your coaching badges haven't you yeah, I've done my B license. I, I want to do my A license, sort of. Um, yeah, when 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 I can, basically. Um, but yeah, I'm 36 now. I still feel in good shape and stuff. But um, I've sort of done coaching alongside playing now the last two three years. Um, found a real passion for that, um, and just I just enjoy sort of passing back my experiences, really, especially yeah. to younger players. Um, and I just love being involved in in the game. Still, um, still got a, you know a huge competitive nature and. Um, love sort of being around it on a match day, day to day, obviously training. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's the the avenue, and then still doing some media bits and pieces. Obviously, I love coming and watching the Blues and, and commentating for for yeah. Blues and for, for WM. So um, yeah, um, sort of. You want to be a you want to be a, you want to be a head coach one day. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, you know, we we talked earlier, haven't we, about sort of the the everything you sort of. There's a lot goes on. You, you know, it's not just about managing the team, is it? It's about you know no. everything else as well, the exterior stuff. But um, but yeah, given you know the the right situation and everything, yeah, I'd probably um, something that I'd you know I'd love to do one day. Yeah, and yeah. We talked we talked last week about Leighton Leighton Webster who uh, had Absolutely. been in the COVID ward for some fifty one weeks, I believe. Uh, apparently he's, he's up and walking now without the aid of any walking frame. Bless him. Oh, amazing well, achievement. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I think it was 59 days, wasn't it? He was 59 in days. That 51, yeah. 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 Time, 59 days. And um, Savage took his telephone number last week and was trying to get in contact with him. But obviously he was, too, you know, drifting in and out of, uh, of, of you know, being really ill and, and kind of... But it was great news to... Find out that he's uh, on the road to recovery, and I'm sure every single person wishes him the best yeah. and the speediest recovery possible. Appa- apparently, Karch, you know, you know, Piers, his cousin. Apparently, Piers. Oh, he works at works at Moore's. Yeah, yeah, yes. If yeah, you, if you, yeah. If you can just say a, a good a, a get well message, and I'll, I'll clip it for later, so you can say from there. For late, uh, for Leighton, sorry. Late oh, yeah. Listen, yeah, um, such a. An inspiration, really, to all of us. I think during these times, it's so good to to hear someone who's you know been through through what you've been through to come through it. Um, just I think gives us all you know a belief um, and inspiration. So you know, wish you all the best. Continue to get stronger, get well, and hopefully um, we can catch up soon. Um, maybe at, at St Andrews at a Blues game. So, oh, perfect. Yeah. That would be brilliant. Be good question. Good, good, good question coming in here from Mark Andrew Adams. Does um, would you ever get your shirt and medal back out of the museum in town? Well, I, I hope I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, I actually contacted them um, not long ago because um, I think they, they, with it was supposed to be initially three years. They extended it out the exhibition um, 
has, has gone on for a bit longer. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely get that back. Um, <laughs> so my dad, my dad would kill me. I think he's got his eyes on, 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 on them anyway. So, um, but yeah, uh, that's something I'll probably actually, um, do in the near future. I'll have that back and get them reframed and, and pride of place. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Mm, good stuff. Good stuff. Any more score predictions coming, Chris, or is that about it? Uh, all score. Oh, uh, uh, Paul Lilly's gone 2 0 blues. Uh, and that's that's about it for the predictions. Uh, would Darren ever fancy coaching the Blues and Robbo together? Would be great. Says Look at the smile on his face. What do you think this answer is going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, like I say, it, it's it, you know, Blues is always going to be um, home for me. Um, whether an opportunity comes up in the future, you know, I'd, I'd, never, I'd never ever say no, obviously. And you know, I speak to Robbo quite a bit and uh, obviously guards as well as guards in a great position, you know, as a first team coach. So um, yeah, listen, you know, it's, uh, it's home for me. Brilliant. One here from uh, Linda. Proud to say my daughter helped nurse him, found out when they clapped him out of ITU. So uh, well done to that one. That's Linda Magna. Uh, proud to say that my daughter helped nurse uh, uh, the poor gentleman who was struck down with COVID nineteen there, Leighton, and uh, found out when, only found out when they clapped him out of ITU. What a wonderful story that is! What a wonderful story! That's fantastic. Uh, Daniel uh, Steve says, new... "Wait till that museum moves by me. I'll look after him." <laughs> <laughs> Mark Adams has gone 4 0 Blues next game against Hall. Ask Karts, does he have any regrets in his career from Stephen Gill? Um, I always try to say no, but, uh, you know, because uh, yeah, I always think, you know, you, your career follows a natural path. But if I did have do overs, um, I think, you know, I would probably, sec- you know, take a bit more, a bit longer over my decision to leave Blues when I did. Um, definitely when I left West Brom to go to Preston um, again that was more over sort of playing time if anything um, and, and starting games with under Tony Mowbray I was sort of playing half coming off the bench in half and I just wanted to really be a, a starter every week and I ended up going to Preston we missed out on the playoffs West Brom went back to the Premier League so, so yeah that one always sort of is a bit of a you know wrangles me a little bit um but no, I mean, I always say I've, I've been very um, blessed, really, to have a, a great career, play with some great players, make some lifelong friends as well. I've, you know, my best pals are, I've met through along the way in, in football. Uh, from and different also players. to return your own football team to the Premier League. That's it, exactly. I, start, I started, you know, on a massive no, high. No, so, no, um, that so moment yeah. can taken away from you. It's written in the history books, so, man. I've been, very, I've been very, very fortunate. So, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think I could, you know, it wouldn't be right if I said I got any regrets. Carter How many times do you reckon you've watched that, Darren? How many times do you reckon you've watched the penalty in 18 years? Uh, it's only when it's been on Twitter and 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 sort of social media. Honestly, um, I watched it back obviously when the, the the club showed it, you know, five or six weeks ago. Um, yeah. But that was the first time I'd actually watched the match. Um, so yeah, people will always send it to me and and different things. And that's the one thing I've loved over the years that as I've got older, um, is different people's stories where they were how they celebrated, um, you know, and it, it's crazy. Like you say, there's some some kids now, 15, 16 year olds come up to me and they'll talk about it. And I'm like, you weren't even born. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they, yeah. they know about it. They've been told about it. They've seen it. Um, it's just mind boggling. Um, and that's, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, people's stories. Uh, once again, once again, I've got goosebumps talking about it, mate. Once again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which you were which, which, which you the Carly yeah, Cup for? Yeah, I was there. Um, yeah. I went. I went on the the the, um, the coach with my dad and all the guys. Um, so yeah, literally, um, I was there. Went back on the coach and that. So that was a diff- that was a good experience, really, going as a fan and yeah. obviously getting soaked on the way into the ground and yeah, um, and everything. But yeah, that was that was crazy and that was great because I was obviously with my dad. So um, and it, uh, the I could count on probably. You know, both fans. How many times I've been to a football game and watched a game with my dad, especially Blues. Um, so it's quite nostalgic when I, I get to do that now. Just quickly, Darren, I, I, on the penalty. I was, um, I was gonna say, just, just on the penalty. Um, Sorry, now. Is it true that you actually um, had to ask the referee uh, just to have to double check that it was actually you were actually going to win if you scored? Yeah, uh, and it, it's it, it's no. sort of so embarrassing now, isn't it? But <laughs> I have to I have to be honest, like it wasn't because I, I didn't know. It was just genuinely because I thought, like I said, I was so confident I was going to score. 
I just didn't want to run off and look like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Do you know what? Can I come in there? It's funny you say that because when you and Robert scored, he thought that was it. That's right. You know, in, in extra time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can see Nigel Worthington telling them, telling, telling his players to stop celebrating and get back into the other half. And I yeah. didn't know that. I, I didn't know that until I met Darren Eady, and he told me that when I was in Ipswich, we were. Well, I, I only knew about that literally when they showed the game five or six weeks ago, and it was it was Colin Tatum who said to me, you know. Um, did you know that you and Roberts thought he'd won it? And I, yeah, I thought it was a golden goal. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there, I've done that myself. Yeah, you have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <pillock. laughs> In the big Ipswich game, I thought that was a golden goal. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, know, you weren't the only one, Daz. I, I, I thought, I didn't realise that that would have been the winner either when you were stepping up either, I had to be told. Well, the, the, the penalty before me, um, I think it was Craig Easton, maybe. Um, Nico Clint, Bass, East, Clint Easton. Clint, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so he, um, if, he had, if he had missed, uh, obviously I wouldn't have had to take one. We would have won 3-1. And yeah. um, I remember actually, God's honest truth, I, I remember thinking, I want him to score because I wanted to take a penalty. And Nico got a hand <laughs> to it. One that Nico actually sort of palms into the side netting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, crazy, really. Well, and the rest is history. Yeah, I don't know. Carter for the Premiership. Isn't it crazy? 18, oh. 18, I was, I'm sorry, 18 years later, and we're still smiling about that moment. Yeah. It's brilliant. And we will do, I'll, I'll smile about it until the day I'm not here anymore. I promise you that. And, but you couldn't uh, have took, you couldn't have nice, took it any better, though. The nicest thing is, Paul, is, is, that, is that there are videos and YouTube clips about these, these moments, these iconic moments in our football history. And, uh, and the kids and the kids to come are going to be able to see them for years and years and years to come. Uh, yeah. And, uh, mm. Yeah. Banging. Uh, Paul McCarthy said our car broke down on the way to Cardiff. Had to race back to Brum and get a lift down. What a day that was. Keep right on. <laughs> um, and Lisa Field, my eight-year-old Ryan, said that was great goal when you scored the winning goal. He watched it. Bless him. And uh, lovely Brenda Brown is watching with us. For Darren, what has been your blessed blues strip from Doz Dozza? Oh, uh, well, I got him uh, early in lockdown. I got him a loft and, and seen sort of all the, the sort of old shirts that I had. Um, oh God, over the years. Um, I always liked the auto windscreens, um, the black and grey stripe one. Oh, um, right. yeah, yeah. And uh, I had that and actually had Claridge 8 on the back. Um, right. I, put, I put it on Twitter, but I didn't put the back. So, yeah, I had Claridge on the back. Um, I always loved that shirt. Literally wore it till, I mean... If you're sitting in my loft now, it's all bitty and everything. I wore it to death, but um, that was always a, a nice uh, one of my favourites. Um, I'm quite nostalgic. So the first season back in 88, 89, my first season watching Blues as a fan, um, I always liked that strip, just the old blue, blue raw blue and white. Um, so, yeah, I'll probably say that them two off the top of my head. Well, there you go. We've almost come to the end. Uh, Michael says, thanks, Darren, for a great chat tonight. Thank you very much indeed. And um, there's lots more messages going to come in over the next couple of minutes. So thank you for your time. And we gen- genuinely appreciate your time. Yeah. But we get a lot of uh, vulnerable listeners and viewers watching us every single week. And we decided that we would keep going through the pandemic, just giving them an hour show. We've extended it to an hour and a quarter tonight. We've had a bit of football to talk about, which has been really unusual. Yeah. And... Uh, Everybody out there I know genuinely appreciates, number one, that penalty take, number two, your commitment, and number three, joining us tonight and and, and, and just coming on and, and chatting, keeping everybody, you know, gathered together, like we're Blues fans, aren't we? Like, we, we, we're, we're a family, we're a family. Yeah. And um, obviously, like, n- n- nobody can wait more than me. I'm 58 years old now, and, I'm, you know, time's running out for me, and there's another generation coming through, but I just cannot wait to get back there, to see them blue seats, to see that green grass, to smell the burgers, to have a pint in Bar 8, and, you know, hear the noises, and, oh, man. Oh, get well soon, Jeremy, as well. Jeremy's been uh, a little bit poorly. Oh, Give yeah. Jeremy a message. Jeremy's one of our yeah. same friends. He's had... Um, uh, diabetes, I think, is he's been uh, struck down. We've lost quite a lot of weight during COVID, even though he's been eating like an absolute trooper. So, Jeremy, and he always he's always at the back of the the stand, going, "Come on, Blues, <laughs> get well soon, Jeremy." Like I say, it'd be great, great for us uh, all to be back at St Andrews and uh, and cheering on the Blue Boys. And if you could say hello to Steve Portman, Sav, uh, Linda, um, Nicholas Wellsbury, uh, Daniel Ricketts, some of the beautiful disabled supporters group out there with Accessi Blues. I really appreciate that as well, mate. No, hello to all you guys as well. Like I say, uh, we're all Blue Noses. We all love the club. So, um, yeah, keep right on. 
and can't wait to be back. Nat Peters, thanks ever so much for joining with us tonight, matey. Good man. No problem, mate. You're always welcome uh, as long as the door's open, but if it's not open, it will be what? Shut. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what, Chris? You've done your one job really well tonight. I know. <laughs> I've made, made no mistakes yet. You've made no errors. <laughs> so it took ten years. So it took ten years. First time in ten years. Paul, thank you again once again for your time, and your knowledge, and for your uh, savant decimals. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Honestly, I don't know where this guy gets his memory from. I, I ain't got a clue, mate. We can, we can remember literally almost every ball we kicked ever. Um, <laughs> Impressive. Mrs. Brown. <laughs> and from myself, listen, keep right on, guys. Football is back. Hall Saturday at St Andrews. Don't bother turning up because you ain't going to get in. Don't bother turning up to wait outside because that would just be stupid. Go and watch it in, you know, in your houses and what have you, one thing or another. Be safe. Look, we're getting through this. So the government tell us. And uh, let's just hope that we can finish this season off. Get on with the season. Somebody just asked me a few minutes earlier, Darren, are you going to be at the um, the local derby next year at St Andrews? Oh, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Yeah. From, from yeah. myself, from myself, Paul Hipkiss, Nat Peters, Chris Brown, and the legend, the absolute legend and friend of the show that is Darren Carter. Thank you so, so, so very much. You are, yeah, Tonight, you we'll are, best yeah. see you next week. Keep right on. Football's mm. cool. It's coming back. It's cool tonight, God. Oh, no, I could talk all night, honestly. Good night, Tara. Good night. Good night, everybody. Away days are great, but there's nothing quite like playing at home. The same goes for McDonald's. Maximise your home ground advantage with McDelivery. Order now on the McDonald's app. At participating restaurants, 18 plus, serving times, delivery fee and terms apply. See mcdonalds.com. This podcast is proud to be part of the TalkSport Fan Network. TalkSport. Powered by fans.